Hello everyone, today I'm speaking with Andrea Gilligan, who's a news reporter with News Talk Radio. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today, Andrea. And I know when you joined Sligo Grammar School, you made the trip from Ballyshannon to Donegal, from Donegal, from Donegal, and you became a boarder. So can you tell me, was it a daunting thing to become a boarder um, for you? It's um, it's weird. I actually really wanted to go to boarding school. Um, I know for a lot of people that go when they become boarders, you know, it might be something that maybe their family did or maybe they were encouraged to do it. But I actually really actively was mad to go to boarding school. I don't know had I watched it in some movie or read about it in a book or what, but I just had this really romantic notion about the idea of uh, of being a boarder and I had the kind of unique experience in that I um, I used to travel from Ballyshannon to Ross's Point in Sligo and I used to sail with my dad there most summers so I actually knew an awful lot of what would have been my year already before I ever went to the school and that's kind of nearly how I used, knew of the school was from actually sailing out in, during the summer in Sligo. So I got to know a lot of friends and they were always talking about their stories about the school and how great the school was and it was something we talked about at home prior to that, would I go to the grammar and it was something we planned I would do but there was a really large intake um, in the year that I would have applied and at the time we couldn't get in. So as it so happened, um, a spot became available when I was in fifth year. So I actually left my school in Ballyshannon a lot later um, in my kind of, you know, secondary level education. And I only went to the grammar for two years. And yeah, of course, it was a bit daunting going like you're packing up and you're heading off and you're thinking I was going to be moving in with 19 other border girls. And although I probably knew maybe two or three of them before I went in, which was great and a huge help because um, one of the girls actually brought me into her dorm with her and I shared in the dorm with her. So that was a huge help to be able to, you know, to have that and that comfort of knowing that you kind of had somebody to take you under your wing a little bit and they could introduce you to people. But I only have one sister, one sibling. So like the idea of sharing with 19 other people was just like, oh my God, what if we don't get on? How is this going to work? Um, but it was great. Like I did the two years in the grammar and I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it. I loved it. Like I, I wish with hindsight I would have gone there if I'd have got in for my whole secondary level education. Um, you know, I would have loved it. Like, But it was such an amazing experience just... I think it was maybe a bit of a novelty of being away from home as well was a huge part of it. But um, I really, really enjoyed it. Like, and I look back at it with, you know, such great memories. Um, like I made so, such amazing, incredible friends there. And in fact, like of the Border Girls, that group of 20 of us, is a group of us still that are still the best of friends, still great mates. And I would, you know, really regard my, actually my friends from the grammar are probably my, my bunch of closest friends that I have, even still to this date, uh, so many years on, I won't say how many, but but it's funny the kind of bonds and the friendships you build, and maybe it is from living with people, and um, you know you really get to kind of know them, and you know it's 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 great that all these years later we're still still the best of friends. Like that's brilliant to hear. So obviously, let's fast forward then to when you were doing your research. And perhaps, as you said there, because of the boarding experience, going to college then wasn't so daunting about moving away from home because you'd already done that. So when you were filling out your CAO, um, I know that you, uh, like myself, followed the pathway and went to NUIG and did a BA. Were you always um, thinking about a career in journalism at that point then? No, absolutely not. And journalism had never entered my head at all. I um, I always had this sort of a, I always kind of wanted to do law and that was always what was in the back of my mind, but I knew I'd never get the points to do straight law. So I knew I was always going to have to do the back door into it and, and let that be through an arts degree. And I sort of had this kind of romantic idea of working as a barrister. I don't know if it was the cloak and wig or what, but I, I kind of had this, that was always what I really wanted to do. Um, so I sort of had it always in my mind that I'd probably do an arts degree and maybe do the LLB after that. But I all, also at the same time still kind of liked business and, like, and, and liked marketing. Um, and I actually had that down as my, my first choice in my CAO. And when the CAO results came out, I was faced with like, God, I got my first choice in marketing. And then I was like, I don't really know if I want to do this. And I think I put it down because I was good at business in school. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. So I ended up actually repeating the leave insert just to kind of re 
reapply through the CAO. So I suppose my advice to people would be make sure you do put your first choice down in your CAO because when you get it, you have to take it. So um, I, I ended up doing an arts degree the following year. Then I started in anyway Galway and did the arts degree. I actually did the denominated one. It's the, um, the BA in uh, public and social policy. And it's really interesting now with hindsight, actually, if I was to advise anyone going into journalism and doing an arts degree, it's probably the course I'd advise them to do because you get the benefit of three subjects throughout. So you do the legal science, the sock and pal, and the economics, and you do them do those three subjects for the three years. But you also do an awful lot about um, Irish and European government and how policy is devised and the impact of that from like a social and economic perspective. So now for the career I'm in, I look back and it actually was a huge benefit, but at the time I, I didn't realise that. Um, my kind of entry into journalism was really bizarre. It was like two weeks before our final exams and I was meant to go home that Easter period to study. And somebody said to me in the canteen in the college one day, did you ever think of journalism? And I was like, no, never thought of journalism. This is so, how, how did I not think of journalism? Like, that's so weird. And I remember ringing home that evening and telling my dad that I was thinking of spending two weeks for holidays um, that I might contact our local radio, Ocean FM, and ask them if I could spend two weeks for doing work experience. And I remember my dad going absolutely mad. He was like, no way, it's two weeks before your final exams in college. This is just some whirlwind decision you've made. You've always wanted to do law. You're not doing this. This is mental. And I was adamant I was going to do it. So I did contact the radio station, did a bit of work experience with them. And after the two weeks, I was like, I love it. I absolutely love this. This is what I want to do. So I started looking up the journalism masters in Galway and you had to have a portfolio together to get in and to show your interest in it, which of course I didn't have. Um, so I ended up spending the subsequent couple of weeks trying to get a portfolio together and I did some work experience in the Sligo Weekender and, and the radio and through those couple of weeks, I had a couple of put together as a profile or a portfolio to get into the masters. So um, I had a meeting with them or an interview, and I applied, and then I got in, and the rest is kind of history. I'm now working in media twelve years, but I mean, for a lot of people, it's it's something they've always wanted to do. But for me, that that wasn't the case. <laughs> Okay, and, it, and it, it's really interesting what you said there about the work experience, the importance of it, um, you know, at any stage for, of doing, not just alone in school, but obviously when you're in college, and um, even a short time doing work experience can be absolutely life-changing. So can you just tell us a little bit then about, um, you worked then with Shannon Sight, and you also did your graft with Ocean FM, as you said. So you were there for two years and then three years before you've been in, in both News Talk and Today FM. So could you just tell us a little bit about um, sort of the day in the life of, of working there with local um, radio? Like for me, local radio is, if for anyone ever thinking of getting into media, your local newspaper, your local radio is, it's the best training ground. It's better than any masters you'll ever do because the level of, you know, hands-on experience that you get, particularly in something like media is key because what every news editor or news organization wants to see from, you know, a new trainee coming in is, well, can you show me something that you've either scripted or that you've, you know, you've, you've, uh, um, recorded or if it's a TV piece or whatever it is but, but you'll get that experience much quicker in the likes of you know your Sligo Weekend or your Sligo Champion or your Ocean FM radios than you will in, in national outlets and sometimes drive to go to the national outlet and of course there is because people you know maybe might be more familiar with it but the experience you get in the locals is you know I think it shouldn't be underestimated and um, I suppose my time there when I was working there when you start out as a junior reporter is very much you're kind of doing the, you know, the local council meetings, you do the local events that are on, the, any kind of local meeting, local protest that might be taking place. You know, you're out and about an awful lot. And that was a huge part of the job, actually, that I loved. I, I just love talking and I love chatting to people and I love meeting people. So for me, when I got to do that at the start, it was really enjoyable, really exciting. Um, and I love the kind of on-air part of the work as well, where you're you know, you're, you're in studio and you're physically, you're actually reading the news or you're presenting a news programme or a news bulletin. So very much when you start at local level, you do a mix, you know, a kind of a marriage of, of, of all of that. You do a little bit of everything and, and that's great because that's what you need. You need. You need to make your mistakes. You need to learn. You need to get the experience. Um, and you tend to find that people work in a local radio, a lot of them are very local to the area and they stay there. So they're there years and 
they're a great help. Like they're, they've so much knowledge to be able to pass on to you and to help you out. And you know what, it, it is a tough job, especially if you're working in your own locality, if you're working in Donegal or you're working in Sligo where I went to school because you know people. Maybe it's your friends, parents that, you know, own a business or maybe they work in, in the emergency services or, you know, you know people. And that can be good and bad. You know, that can be a great help in journalism because you need contacts and information. But equally, you know, it can be tough if, if there is a story that develops about. So, I mean, it's very hard sometimes to get that balance right and to leave your kind of personal views and your personal opinion of stuff to one side. But you will kind of be faced with that a little bit more in the local area. So I was lucky in that my first job was in Shannon side in Northern Sound. So it was in Longford and Monaghan. So it meant that while I was close enough to home, I was still far enough away that I really didn't know anybody. So that was kind of great for your, your training ground, you know, in the initial stages. Like. Okay, so then you obviously made the big decision to move to Dublin, and um, then you worked with. Are you obviously working now with News Talk? So maybe you just tell us about that transition going from mm. uh, local radio into to, to the national broadcaster. I think that that was probably the most difficult career decision I've ever made because at the time it it was two thousand and thirteen. Um, I had just, I was working in back in Ocean FM and I had worked in local radio at this stage for about six years. I was working as the news editor in Ocean FM at the time and I was in a really good, secure job and I loved it and I loved living back in Sligo and I had friends there um, and I was getting on really well. But I suppose I'd worked in local radio for six years and I really wanted to just give the national radio a shot. But in 2013, like the country was still really only coming out of the previous options where to either stay in the steady job I was in or quit it and go freelance and move to Dublin with absolutely no certainty whatsoever, which to most people was just like baffling that I would consider doing this. But I knew I was young enough and I really wanted to give this a shot. I had to just cut my ties and go. So I did and I moved to Dublin um, and I had no security of any work. Like I did not know how many hours work I was going to have per week. Like you're constantly thinking, how am I going to pay my rent if I have a bad month, if I don't get enough work? So you're always trying to do that extra little bit every week. So if there is a quiet month, you know, you have enough to pay your rent. But um, but thankfully, I had two and a half years freelancing with News Talk in Dublin. And I never had a short week or never had a short month. In actual fact, I had, you know, I ended up being really lucky and had loads of work. But I just took everything that I got all the time. So I ended up working constantly. Um, but it was great experience. It was my foot in the door to national radio. I then left after two and a half years and I went freelancing in RTE. And I freelanced there for about seven months. Um, and I was only there about seven months when a permanent job came up in News Talk. And I applied for it and I got it. So I was freelancing in Dublin for effectively about two and a half, three. I've been in my permanent job. I'll be about five years in. It was a big change because there was a huge decision-making process to be made around leaving permanent security you know leaving a job where you had a wage coming in every month and you didn't have to worry about it to kind of becoming a little transition but I think if you really wanted to break through um scene or national media like I knew it was something I was going to have to do so um like obviously now looking back five years later I've, I've no regrets but at the time it was I remember you know my head was tormented trying to make this decision like Good advice there, because just sometimes you have to take a chance um, cause you ha and believe in yourself that it will work out long term. Now, I know with News Talk, mm. no, no two days are the same for you, but you have an early start. So can you just tell us maybe a little bit about your current job and a, a day in the life of, of Andrea Gilligan, broadcast journalist? Three years when I came back to News Talk, I worked as the news anchor. So I was the you know news, news presenter in the afternoon from uh, midday from 12 o'clock until 7 o'clock in the evening, which like in Radio Land, these are the best hours you could possibly get. They're golden hours. They're brilliant. And I loved it. But I kind of always had, you know, an interest and an appetite to, to work in radio. It's kind of really where I, I kind of want to be long term. So um, an opportunity came up to do a weekend show. So I started presenting a weekend show on Sunday mornings. And then subsequently after that, another opportunity came up to do an early morning news program. Now, that's what I'm doing for the last 18 months. The only catch is that I have to get up at 10 to 4 in the morning and be at my desk for half four and read nine newspapers and be on air by six o'clock. So it's a really early start, but I love doing it. Like it's, you're the first on air at any station across the country. Um, you have the first opportunity to kind of you know, use a general talk about them and to, to go through the papers on air this morning. But like, you know, if you're not a morning person, it's tough going. Um, you drink a lot of coffee, you're exhausted, have a nap every afternoon. You know, th these are the realities of, of uh, the kind of the great 
the yard shift or the, the early morning slots. But it's brilliant and I love it. I'm doing it for 18 months. Um, so my morning kind of consists of coming into work, um, going through all the newspapers, and that obviously takes time to find the, the best stories to select for what's kind of a 10, 12 minute news review. So it's, it's pretty lengthy. Um, we put our news bulletin together, which is about eight minutes or so, and then you have a, a morning interview. So whatever the big story of the day is, you're us usually interviewing somebody then about that. So the show's on air for 30 minutes, and then I work as the news anchor in the morning from seven o'clock until 10. And then one day a week, then I usually record my uh, my weekend show, and um, that's now pre-recorded to go out at the weekend. So it's busy, but it's 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 you know in many ways it's a very short day, and people always think, oh, but you get to finish really early, and you do, and that's great, you know, um, gives you plenty of time for a good nap. So that's always important. But it's a uh, it's it's a it's a busy slot, but it's um it's really enjoyable. Like. So Andrea, for you, what would you say um, has been the most memorable kind of news story or event maybe that you or a person you've interviewed um, in, in your career to date? Like I've been really lucky to kind of work at the forefront of so many major things that have happened in kind of Irish society in the last um, in the last couple of years. And there's days that you you sometimes you're, you're you're working at an event or you're covering something and you're kind of thinking god this is just happening and like you're there at the thick of it and probably actually the most recent one not necessarily memorable for a good or a, or a bad reason but the most recent memory um was actually just in the past couple of weeks the the first day that we had the big announcement from um the Tisha Leo Bradker about the the big lockdown be the first day lockdown was being announced and I, I was actually presenting the programme because it was only happened quite late on a Friday evening and I got the call to say, can you come in to do this programme? So I was out for a walk at the time and I remember running home to try and get showered and changed to get back into work for eight o'clock that evening. And um, I remember as I was listening to Thetrick's announcement and you know, presenting the programme afterwards thinking like, this is a day, you're never going to forget the day that you announced on air that the country's going, you know, was effectively going into lockdown. And I was like, this is something in my too like I remember the same sex marriage referendum and I remember working on the, the level of emotion across society and the significance of this was, was such a huge thing for the country and um, I remember that being a really memorable day to you know to work at that and Dublin Castle and the scenes from us you know afterwards as well so I suppose there's days you get to work at some of these events and you're like it's kind of mad to you know to be there at the very very those kind of big moments actually happen you know so for you, um, obviously she won't last uh, forever in terms of, of she might retire, Miriam O'Callaghan. Would you have aspirations perhaps for um, moving it into TV or are you, are you loyal and happy with radio? Um, I, I definitely love Miriam O'Callaghan's salary if that's not offer anyway. But um, I, you know, I, I have worked in a little bit of radio or I've worked in, in a little bit of television, done a little bit of TV work um, over the past number of years. And I like it. I enjoy it. But I think my heart is very much in radio. Like I don't have any aspirations to, to quit radio, to go into TV. But, um, you know, you, you never know in this industry. Like it's, it's a very, it's a very changeable um, sector to work in and, and, and stations can have different demands and sometimes people can be impacted by that so it's kind of hard to know it's very hard to know like where am I going to be in 10 years time maybe through no fault of your own um, so I, I don't know like I, I still do a little bit of part time the odd TV work just in terms of commentary and analysis and that sort of stuff and I like it but I suppose there's so much more to consider with television um, you, you have to get up even earlier to get yourself ready and that part definitely doesn't appeal to me um, but, it's, but it's, it's a very different medium like what I love about radio is kind of the intimacy of it and I love the fact that you know in many ways you're chatting to people and they might be in their car or they might be at home in their bed or they might be getting up and getting ready and you might be the only person sometimes particularly for elderly people you might be the only voice or the only person they're hearing for that period of time like and there's something there's something kind of very unique I always find about radio so I don't have any aspirations to quit radio TV but I mean like a true politician you <laughs> I you know you never know what's going to happen you know so I never rule anything in a race. <laughs> Thanks a million Andrea and lots of advice there so just if you have you any imparting words of advice that you'd like to give to any uh, budding journalists out there? Yeah, one of the biggest things I did actually, I forgot to mention in my time in Sligo Grammar School was I took part in um, in the debating, um, or in not the debating society, but myself and another one of my uh, colleagues or students at the time, Nicola McGuinness, both took part in the national debating finals. And I remember we got the All-Ireland semi-finals. And I think for anyone that's interested in 
journalism or whether it's politics or current affairs, like I think get involved in public speaking and debating because just the strength to be able to do that, the qualities and the skills that gives you, I think is immense. Just the courage to speak in front of people is a really difficult thing to do and it still like frightens me even now, but I know that was a huge help. Um, the other thing I'd say is like, there is huge pressure on students today and we all felt that like, you know, I, I changed career completely um, at the very last moments before, you know, doing my final exams in college and, you know, it's come good and it's come fine. And like the thing about journalism is it is, it is a tough, it's a tough industry and it's, and it's hard and it's difficult to get into. But I think if you're really keen and you're really interested and you will have to work so hard to get into it and work hard at it, but if you're committed to it and you're hungry for it, and that's what the big thing editors want when you're hiring people, you, it's not that you necessarily want the best writer or the best on-air person, but you want the person that is the hungriest and the person that wants it the most and the person that will sit out the story all night and you want that drive. And that's, they're the kind of qualities that when I was hiring people for jobs, that's what you look for. Um, and there is an element of luck that comes with it. It can be timing. You know, sometimes timing comes good for you. Sometimes it doesn't. You just have to take that with a bit, bit of, you know, a pinch of salt. It's out of your control sometimes. So I wouldn't be too disheartened by that. But I'd always just say to students, like anytime I talk to them, you know, don't be afraid to experiment with courses in college because like a degree isn't necessarily where your undergrad isn't necessarily where you're going to be. You'll probably end up doing a postgrad or you'll maybe go and do work experience in something and end up in a different area. So don't be afraid to do that. Like I did that and it's come grand. Um, and just, you know, if you can, if you are thinking of a career in media, definitely try and get a little bit of work experience, like your local radio station, your local newspaper, they're always happy to have people in, usually anyway. So, I mean, they're worth contacting and asking, could you go in and see what they do or try and get a little bit of experience just to see if it, if it is actually for you, you know. Andrea, thanks so much for all of your advice and your time today. Um, I wish you the very best of luck and everybody get tuned in to hear it, listening to Andrea Saturday nights, 8 to 9 on News Talk. And of course, the early morning uh, from 6 to 6.30 and throughout the morning as well. Andrea, thanks again for your time. Thank you. No problem. Thanks.